everyone. So with this module, we are going to be learning about our leg ultrasound. When we are performing ultrasounds of the leg, we are usually evaluating the venous system for DVT or deep vein thrombosis. We can do arterial ultrasounds of the leg, but you know, that's not necessarily as common. Um, a DVT venous leg ultrasound is really something that you are going to be performing in any place that you work, outpatient, inpatient, even at an OB facility, we're doing um, DVT evaluation pretty much across a variety of clinical settings. So we're going to get into the specifics of the venous system and the um, hemodynamics of the venous system once we start our vascular class in the fall. So when we come back to this in a few months, a lot of this material um, will kind of just be a refresher, but we'll take it a little step further. Uh, we'll learn more about the valves. We'll learn more about some additional venous testing that we can do. Um, but for right now, I really want you guys to be able to participate in performing these exams in the clinical setting, especially as we approach the summer semester. So some physiology on the venous system, again, very basic. The main purpose of the venous system is to return deoxygenated blood back to the heart. So our arterial system brings oxygenated blood to the distal tissues, and then the venous system brings all the deoxygenated blood and all of the waste products back to the heart to be filtered again through the cardiac contraction. So technically, this is going to be a little bit confusing, but technically the venous system originates or it starts at those distal tissues where the arteries end. So where the artery communicates with the, vein, the venous system or the vein itself is in that capillary bed of those distal tissues or those capillary networks. So that's technically the proximal part of our venous system. And then it's going to terminate or it's going to end or its distal segment is going to be back at the heart. So when we're performing a leg ultrasound, we've done these in lab at this point, when we're performing that leg ultrasound, we're calling our femoral vein prox when we're up at the hip, right, in the top of the thigh. And then we're calling that femoral vein distal when we're at the knee. When in actuality, in pure medical relationship, the proximal portion of the vein and the venous system in the leg is actually down in the toes. And the distal region, the more distal we get, is up towards the hip and the groin and then up into the belly and back into the heart. So we keep all of our annotations as proximate and distal from the um, hip down to the knee just for sanity purposes and just for consistency purposes um, in the radiology world. But you have to remember that on a purely an anatomic relationship. The proximal venous system starts at those distal tissues and the distal venous system ends at the heart. Now the venous system throughout the entire body is a low pressure system. Our arterial system is a very high pressure system. We're going to learn all about that relationship between the high pressure um, arterial system and the low pressure venous system in the fall. But for right now, we need to know that it's a low pressure system. And this is the basics of those fluid behaviors or our hemodynamics. With the venous system, because it's low pressure, it's going to be heavily influenced by any type of change in that pressure. So it's going to be very sensitive to a lot of different factors and it's gonna be very easily influenced. So as we're breathing, that's going to have an effect on our venous flow. As we're standing, that's going to have an effect on our venous flow. If we are um, on bed rest or we are uh, in a wheelchair and we have immobility, right? We're not moving those legs that's going to have an effect on that pressure in the venous system. And then also any type of cardiovascular disease that has an overall systemic effect. So if there's any type of arterial output condition or condition that affects the output of the arterial system, that's going to have a ripple effect on the venous system and the flow in the venous system as well. So we'll get more into this in the fall, but just on a basic level, we need to know that it's a low pressure system and it's heavily influenced by a lot of different factors. Now the venous anatomy, these veins 
because it's a low pressure system, are going to be very easily compressible. Our artery is high pressure. It has really fast traveling boluses of blood traveling through the arteries. Our heart contraction is creating this really big pressure wave and it's shooting all of that blood through these arteries. So the arteries are high pressure. When we have high pressure in the arteries, we can't compress them as easily, right? But because the veins are low pressure, we can squeeze them. We can get them to collapse. We can get those walls to touch. And that's what we want for a patent vein, meaning a normal functioning vein. The veins also, they are going to display continuous respiratory phasic flow. So that blood flow is going to continue to be um, uniform. We're going to see those changes when the patient takes a breath in or when they hold their breath or when they blow that breath out. But for the most part, we're going to see wave forms below the baseline, kind of like this, right? Sometimes we'll see a little bit of that. And then like this, right? But when we have arterial waveforms, we get that rhythmic arterial pulse. And no breathing or gravity is going to affect that. Now, the walls of our veins, kind of similar to the arteries, but um, a little bit different in their composition. The arterial walls are really uh, strong. They have a lot of muscle fibers in them. The vein walls, not as much because we don't need them to be. Uh, so we have the tunica intima, the innermost layer that's continuous with the blood as it's traveling through the lumen. We have the tunica media in the middle, and then we have the tunica adventitia. Now, every structure in the body needs to have some type of blood flow to it and our veins are no different so although they're part of the venous system they still have little arteries that are supplying blood flow to the walls of the vein to keep those walls functioning properly so those little vein um excuse me those little arteries those are going to be traveling along the outside of that vein wall so on the tunica adventitia we're going to have this little network of tiny little arteries that supply blood flow to the vein wall, and that's known as the vase of basorum. Our veins also unique to veins. Our arteries do not have any valves. We have valves in the veins. These are going to be bicuspid valves. So in the heart, we have tricuspid valves. We have some bicuspid valves, but in the peripheral veins, meaning the veins outside of our heart, we are going to have bicuspid valves. So we're just going to have these two kind of doors that swing open and swing closed in the vein. Now those valves are extensions of that intimal layer, so that inner layer of that vein wall. The purpose of veins is to prevent backflow. We're going to learn all about hydrostatic pressure in the fall, and that is pressure due to gravity and how our body responds to it. Now, if you think about when you're just standing up, right, you have all this gravity playing a role on your body. When you think about the venous return from your legs, all of that venous blood supply is fighting gravity and it's already a low pressure system. So we have a low pressure system trying to make it back up as it's fighting gravity. So the vein, the, excuse me, the valves are there to help that flow go back to the heart without it back flowing back down to the feet. So we'll learn all about that process in the fall, but kind of just to piece that together a little bit better. And then we also have um, our musculature, which, which helps us to shoot that blood back up to the heart as well. So as you're walking and your calf muscles are contracting, those muscle contractions are helping to also create pressure in the venous system to send the blood back up to the heart. So we have our overall systemic anatomy of the venous system. Now I have certain veins here uh, highlighted in green and then certain veins highlighted in orange. The green are going to be our deep veins, part of our deep system. Our orange are going to be part of our superficial system. Now some of these veins, it's a little bit controversial in different literature and you may have different radiologists and different protocols that see different things regarding some of the calf veins. Some people say that all of the veins in the thigh are deep and all of the veins in the calf are superficial, but that's not necessarily true. There are some differences in the way that these veins drain. So we're starting from the distal most part of the body 
which is technically the proximal part of the venous system. So we're starting down in the toes. So our toes, we have these digital veins that are draining each of our toes. In the foot, they're going to join together to form metatarsal veins. Those metatarsal veins are going to join to form our plantar arches. And now technically, these are considered part of the uh, deep system, but to me, I consider these superficial. Now, guys, I'm so sorry. I read all this wrong. Ah! No, okay, so our green, I'm sorry. Our green are our um, superficial system and our orange are our deep system. I'm like, I knew something didn't sound right as it was coming out of my mouth. So I do consider these to be our uh, superficial system. A lot of literature is going to say that these veins in the foot are also part of the superficial system. We're going to talk about what the difference between the deep and the superficial systems are in a few slides, but just talking about our uh, flow through these different veins in terms of the systemic anatomy. So we have the veins in our toes joined together to form metatarsal veins. Our metatarsal veins join to form our plantar arches. Think of plantar as you plant your feet on the ground, right? You plant a tree in the ground, your roots. So plantar are going to be on the bottom aspect of our feet. And then those plantar arches are going to move around the back of our foot and up into our calf. Now from the plantar arches, we are going to get two posterior tibial veins and two perineal veins that travel up the backside of the calf. We also get two anterior tibial veins, which are going to loop around the front of our shin and travel up our leg that way. Now, I consider all six of these to be part of the deep system. Again, we will talk about what that means in a minute. So technically, as of right now, we already have six calf Veins, six veins that are traveling through our calf, four in the back, two in the front. Now, we also in the calf have these gastrocnemius veins. One is going to drain the medial side of the gastroc muscle. The other is going to drain the lateral side of the gastroc muscle. So we have the medial gastrocnemius vein and the lateral gastrocnemius vein. All of these veins are somehow going to join and communicate together at the back of the knee in that pop fossa. Now we have our, at that region, as we're traveling up to the back of our leg, we have our posterior tibial veins and our perineal veins, right? So we have four veins right there. They join together to form the tibio perineal trunk. That's going to travel for a short segment behind the knee, and then the anterior tibial veins are going to come from the front of the calf, loop around the back, and then dump into that tibioperineal trunk as well. So now we have two more veins being added into that region. The combination of the tibioperineal trunk and the two anterior tibial veins is going to create the popliteal vein. This is still part of the deep system. Now, into the popliteal vein, our medial and lateral gastroc veins are going to drain into that. Our popliteal vein, as it travels up the back of our thigh, is going to become the femoral vein. Now, if we remember from lab, this can be a little confusing because some people refer to this as the SFV or the superficial femoral vein. It is still part of the deep system. So our femoral vein is going to travel up our thigh and it's going to travel up into our groin. And before it becomes our common femoral vein, our profunda vein or our deep femoral vein, which is not part of the deep system, is going to drain or join with that femoral vein. Also, our greater saphenous vein from the other side is going to join with that femoral vein. And all of that junction is going to become that common femoral vein. Now, as that common femoral vein travels up into the pelvis through that inguinal canal, it's going to become the external iliac vein. We have our internal iliac vein, which drains our deep pelvis. So in females, our uterus, our ovaries, our rectum, um, all of the, our, um, uh, gluteal muscles are going to drain into that internal iliac vein. So that's going to join with the external iliac vein to become the common iliac vein. And we have one on each side. And those two, the right and left common iliac vein, are going to drain together to 
form the IVC, which as we know, dumps back into the heart to start that cycle all over again. So a lot of different pathways here. So here's a, a pretty um, basic drawing of what those relationships look like. So let's start on our way from the bottom to the top. So down at the bottom, we have our digital veins here. They're going to join right in this region to form the metatarsal veins. And then as we get kind of the arch of the foot, the plantar aspect, we're going to have our plantar arches. This is called the dorsal venous arch on this diagram, but just for right now, our plantar arch or arches. And from that plantar arch, we are going to have these um, posterior tibial and perineal. We're not seeing them that well on this diagram, but I believe our next diagram has them a little bit uh, more clearly. Let's go over to this picture on the right hand side. So we're looking at this from the back view. So we have our plantar arch here, and then we have our posterior tibial vein coming up here. Now this is going to run right parallel with our perineals. Our perineals are gonna be traveling right next to it like that. Slightly deeper, which is confusing because you would think the posterior tibial veins would be deeper, but they're not. The perineals are deeper. Um, so then both of those are going to travel up and see this little junction right here. That's that tibial perineal trunk. So that's where the four of those um, veins are joining together. Then right here, right above it, we have our anterior tibial vein. And so this is the extension of the tibial perineal trunk right there. We have our anterior tibial vein joining in to form our popliteal. Now our popliteal, once it travels through that adductor hiatus, that space in the back of the knee, the popliteal fossa, it's going to become the femoral vein and that's going to travel all the way back up into the um, groin region. Our deep femoral vein or our profunda is going to join with it. Our greater saphenous is going to join with it. Right at that hip, it's going to become the common femoral vein. And then as we get up into the pelvis, it's that external iliac vein joining with our internal iliac vein to become the common iliac. My little drawing thing, I can't. When I go to draw, I don't know if you guys can see that, but when I go to draw, like this little toolbar pops down and I can't see the top of the picture. Um, so that common femoral will um, become the external iliac vein once it travels up into the pelvis. Once it's in the pelvis, the internal iliac vein will join with it and they will become the common iliac veins. And then the right and left common iliac vein from each leg will join together to form the IVC. So the, um, the main thing to take away from this is the relationship of the calf veins, right? And then also the relationship of what happens right at the hip. So right at the two joints, you have a lot of converging happening. So you have at the knee, you have your four posterior tibial veins and perineal veins joining together to form tibial perineal trunk. The anterior tibial veins join into that to form the popliteal. The popliteal travels up out of the knee into the thigh to become the femoral vein. And then up at the hip, the femoral vein has the profunda drain into it, also has the greater saphenous vein drain into it to become the common femoral. Once it travels up into the pelvis, it now becomes the external iliac so on and so forth. So here's another example, a um, little bit blurry, but again, you can kind of see, we have a posterior view on the right-hand side. So you can kind of see some of those calf veins a little bit. Again, we're not really showing the perineal veins, um, but we just want to be aware of that relationship of where these veins are joining um, and what vein drains into what to become a new vein. All right, so our deep and superficial system, we really only care about the deep system. And the reason for that is because it's going to carry 85% of the blood flow in our legs. Only 15% is going to um, be traveling or come from the superficial system. So unfortunately, we just don't really care too much about our superficial system, even if there's a clot in it, because the likelihood of that clot traveling in a superficial vein is unlikely. Um, because there's just not as much blood flow traveling through it to begin with. So we really are looking at the deep system veins to truly give them a great evaluation. Um, 
we do have what are called perforators and perforators are kind of like a little detour and they connect the deep system to the superficial system and then we also have these veins called tributaries and they drain the muscle tissues so technically the medial and the lateral gastrocnemius veins would be considered tributaries because they're draining um, venous blood right from a specific muscle so the deep system is really what we're focusing on um, you can get clots in the superficial system but because of the relationship uh, anatomy wise, we don't really care about them too often. The only time that we are really going to treat a superficial clot um, as worrisome as is if it is uh, really close to that junction with the deep system. So as we said, the profunda and the greater saponus are technically part of the superficial system, but we know they drain right into the femoral vein. So if there's a clot at that junction, where all of those superficial veins are draining into the deep vein, we need to be aware of that because that vein, that clot can very easily drain right into the deep system and then we have a true DVT. So we just need to be aware of that relationship. So moving on to our uh, venous evaluation, so more of the ultrasound uh, process. Why are we doing these exams? How do we perform these exams? What are some things for us to look out for? So the main reason why we are doing a um, venous leg ultrasound is to evaluate for DVT. So deep vein thrombosis, you can have acute or chronic. Uh, we also can perform these exams for venous insufficiency. So our veins aren't working as well as they should. For varicose veins, you see some people have those spider looking veins or they have those grapefruit looking bunches on their calf, not grapefruit, like actual grapes. Um, on their calf also for congenital reasons so some patients have um, conditions that result in hypercoagulability and that means that their blood clots much easier than the average person so of course they're going to be more prone to um, clot in the future so we just need to be aware of any of those congenital conditions and then also for pulmonary embolism so anytime a clot or a thrombosis whether it be acute or chronic Anytime that starts to travel in the venous system, so that clot breaks loose and now it's moving, we call that an embolism. So a clot will become an embolism once the clot moves. Pulmonary embolism means it has traveled all the way to the lungs. So it has embolized from its spot in the vein and it's traveled all the way back up to the heart it's traveled through the heart and has now gone into the pulmonary system. So that's a pretty serious condition to have. We can have an embolism that really kind of gets stuck in one of three places. One, in the heart itself, two, in the lungs, and three, in the brain. So we really need to make sure that we are taking our job seriously and that we are not missing any type of DVT so that the patient doesn't run the risk of having a massive heart attack or a stroke from some type of embolus. Um, of course, if the patient um, has a history or a recent diagnosis of a pulmonary embolism or any type of embolism, we're going to be looking in the legs. We're going to be doing a DVT exam after the fact to see if there's any residual clot where that embolism could have broken off from. Some signs and symptoms, mainly of um, thrombosis, We'll get into some of those other uh, conditions in the fall, but since I'm in symptoms, acute DVT, this is going to be really uncomfortable for patients. It is severe leg pain, severe cramping, kind of like these brutal Charlie horses. They're going to come in with massive swelling, redness. Their skin is going to be warm to the touch, so erythema. Those are classic signs of a acute DVT, an acute DVT. Chronic DVT, sometimes these patients just have these ongoing clots or they just keep getting clots or their clots aren't resolving. And that has to happen for a period of greater than two months. The symptoms are going to be similar to acute, but we're also going to start to see some more serious and irreversible clinical symptoms. And one of them is going to be discoloration of skin. So our skin is going to kind of start to like give up at that point and it's going to start to change color because it's constantly responding to the stagnant blood flow in that region where the clot is. The blood's not moving through the way that it should because there's a clot, right? So 
our skin is going to represent that stasis of blood. And then unfortunately, that stasis of blood can result in venous ulcerations um, or other types of ulcers in the skin as well. So the veins, when they are constantly responding to some type of DVT, they can't function the way that they need to because there's just this consistent clot in that area, the veins are going to give up right? Like any other organ in the body, if it's constantly fighting against something that's not normal, the veins are going to say, listen, I quit. I'm done. I've had it. So they're going to stop working. That's going to result in inefficiency. They're going to become really small. They're going to become really scarred. So even if we somehow clear up that chronic DVT, those veins are going to be permanently damaged because of it. So let's take a look at some mild pictures of what DBT can look like. Um, I did post some pictures in the module about um, ulcerations. They can be uh, pretty nauseating, I guess is the right word. Vascular is not the modality for everyone. It's not the specialty for everyone. We deal with a lot of nasty feet. Um, and we'll learn more about that in the fall. So just kind of giving you a little bit of a warning. If you also have a queasy stomach, I would probably not look at the folder um, in the module, but to see some more severe uh, venous ulcerations, you can uh, look in there as well. So picture on the left-hand side, I mean, this is pretty significant swelling of that patient's left leg. Um, even down in the calf, you can see that redness, you can see that erythema. If you were to touch this on that patient, I mean, that's gonna be warm to the touch. So that's a pretty obvious clinical uh, observation. Now we're getting more into the chronic DVT with that discoloration of the skin. Um, and then same thing over here, this last picture, this is kind of borderline between could it be an acute thrombus or could it be more of a chronic thrombus? So we would need to be aware of that patient's clinical history. You can see that swelling of this leg here and we can't really tell, is this redness of the skin or is it becoming discoloration of the skin? So we would need a little bit more information on that patient on the right-hand side to determine if it's truly acute versus chronic. So there are some risk factors that make a patient um, more easily susceptible to DVT. So a lot of these conditions or these risk factors are, you know, things that we can't necessarily control. So our age, of course, the older we get, the more at risk we are for DVT. Our blood flow starts to slow down. Our cholesterol levels tend to go up. So our blood gets a little bit thicker, um, has a hard time moving through the system. Um, our valves start to not work as efficiently. Um, so unfortunately, that's just the product of aging. Also, any patient who has cancer, so sometimes uh, cancer treatment itself will make your blood a little bit thicker um, and a little bit, you know, causing your veins to not work as effectively. Um, and sometimes, depending on if you have uh, enlarged lymph nodes with cancer, those lymph nodes can block the vein, kind of creating this pressure on the vein and therefore stagnant blood flow. And then that blood gets stuck and turns into a clot. Um, so there are a lot of different associations with cancer that would make it be considered a risk factor. Uh, bed rest or inactivity, of course, if you're not moving, um, you know, the blood's going to have a harder time traveling. So it's going to get kind of stuck in these um, spots in our venous system and it's going to get stagnant and it's going to get thick so we're going to get that uh, clot in those regions any history of a prior dvt trauma also hormones is a really big one so if you are a young female patient on birth control you are at a higher risk of getting a blood clot so that's something that you know if you were to read that really long informational packet in your uh, birth control package it would probably say something along the lines of uh, dvt in there as a risk um, also paraplegia so you have a difficult time moving um, your limbs uh, or paralysis any type of surgery after a lot of surgeries they will give you blood thinners to take to prevent blood clots from occurring um, um, but I believe that has to do with anesthesia. The anesthesia medication makes our blood uh, slightly more prone to clotting. I'm not 100% sure on that, but I think that that's the association with surgery. So a lot of times, um, and then also, you know, sometimes you're, you know, you're unable to move for a few days after surgery. So that's that um, bed rest um, risk. 
uh, also pregnancy has a really big factor on blood clots as well and thrombophlebitis. So I previously said that when you have a clot in your superficial system, we don't really care about it. And we technically don't in that instance, but that is known as thrombophlebitis. So when you have a thrombus in the superficial vein, that vein gets really angry and it's really painful for the patient, but it doesn't it doesn't mean that it's a DVT because it's not in the deep vein system. It's not really going to travel, but it can be really annoying for the patient. Um, so that's known as thrombophlebitis when we have that clot and inflammation of that superficial vein. If a patient has that, they are at a greater risk of getting an actual DVT. Virchow's triad is the combination of requirements necessary to form a blood clot. So we have to have stasis of blood flow, meaning that that blood flow for some reason is slowing down, or that blood flow for some reason is thicker than it should be. So we have hypercoagulability. So whatever reason that may be, medication, um, you know, cert recent surgery, um, vessel wall injury, so trauma, prior DVT, uh, thrombophlebitis, that's all going to result in, you know, weakening of that vein wall, those factors are going to be the main contribution to the formation of a thrombus. And those three things are known as that Virchow's triad. Now, this is mainly all associated with a lower extremity ultrasound or DVT. Um, when you have an upper extremity vein, the causes of DVT in the upper extremity veins are less likely. So we're really only seeing one of two things happening when we see a DVT in the arm. One, really sick patients, cancer patients, patients who have had recent dialysis, patients with a port for chemotherapy administration, patients with a PICC line for any other type of medication administration. So really sick patients who have these constant interventional procedures on their arm and then also IV drug users. So there's really not as much gray area between the two causes of upper extremity DVT. That's really all we're working with. We don't just spontaneously see um, a pregnant woman with an upper extremity DVT. We don't just see a, uh, you know, a, a patient with some type of cancer well, that's not true because they would have a port or a pick line, um, but we don't just see a random person getting a DVT in the upper um, extremity venous system. So arms are a little less common to be performing. Legs is kind of like the bread and butter in terms of looking for a DVT, but just something to be aware of. Um, I also had a, uh, a patient who was suffering from chronic DVT and he was an air marshal. So he was flying for a living um, on several flights a day. And due to that pressure on his venous system from the altitude, also due to the inactivity of him sitting for flights. Um, and then he also had vessel wall injury because he was wearing a gun holster on his ankle. So her, his calf veins were constantly clotted because of that. Um, so I thought that that was a little interesting type of scenario. So here is our leg protocol. We've kind of walked through this already. Um, we're starting with our transverse pictures of compression, proving that there's no DVT in that deep vein system uh, particularly. Then we're going back and we're doing our color pictures with our augmentation to prove valve patency. We're taking images of our popliteal fossa, that space behind the knee, making sure that there's no Baker cyst in that area. Um, and then we're also doing our calf vein pictures. We're looking at those two gastrocnemius veins. We're looking at the two posterior tibial veins, the two perineal veins. Um, we're not always evaluating the anterior tibial veins. I will show you guys how to obtain those pictures, but a lot of protocols do not uh, include those um, veins in them for some reason. I don't make the rules. Um, I'm just the messenger. So I will show you how to obtain those pictures, but you will not need to know those in terms of your competencies or potential simulations in the program. So there are some rules when we're performing a DVT ultrasound. It is so crucial that we're performing compression every two centimeters down the entire leg 
um, the entire length of that patient's leg vein. So that's going all the way from common femoral and compressing, 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 compressing until we get to the popliteal vein. Compression is how we're going to prove or disprove that there is clot in that region. If we see a clot really high up, so we put that probe down to get that common femoral picture and we see a clot in the common femoral, we need to go up further. So we need to go up and evaluate that external iliac vein in the pelvis. And then we need to check our IVC to see if there's any extension of that clot into the abdomen and pelvis. If at any point that we're performing our compressions and a vein is truly non-compressible, you will not perform augmentation. Augmentation is the squeezing of that cap, right? We're creating a high pressure situation in a low pressure venous system. So if there's a clot in the vein and you squeeze and you send blood pressure traveling through really rapidly, it runs the risk of embolizing that clot. It runs the risk of loosening that clot and having it travel. So we don't wanna be the reason why a patient has a stroke or a heart attack. So we, that's why we're performing our compression pictures first. Once we have compressed everything, we've proven patency of the vein, meaning the vein is fine, there's no clot in it, then we can go back and perform the augmentation. And any thrombus visualized within a superficial vein that is located within two centimeters of joining with a deep vein is going to be considered and treated like a DVT. So like we said, if the greater saphenous vein has a clot right next to where it joins at the femoral vein, then we need to consider that a DVT because of how closely related um, they are. And augmentation, we've talked about this as well, but just to reiterate, this is only going to be done if we've proven patency. So we've done our compression pictures and now we're going back and doing our color and Doppler pictures. Um, this should only be performed by manually squeezing the patient's calf. So sometimes you'll see technologists asking the patient to push on the gas pedal and that mimics an augmentation, but that's not a true augmentation. It's not a true representation of the valves functioning. So it's kind of cheating and we don't wanna be doing that when we're performing these exams. Augmentation can be really challenging on a really tall patient or um, a really large patient or a patient in a hospital bed. So if you have somebody who is available to help you squeeze, ask them to come with you. Uh, we also want to make sure that we're accommodating the patient's location of pain. So if they have really sensitive or severe pain in the mid portion of their calf, well, then we want to squeeze a little bit closer to the ankle or if their ankle's really bothering them, then we wanna squeeze a little bit closer to the meat of the calf. So we just wanna be considerate of that if we can. Uh, we wanna evaluate on our Doppler a few seconds of normal venous flow before we squeeze. So we wanna establish that normal vein flow and waveform before we give an augmentation. And then we also wanna show a second or two of that venous flow returning back to normal. So that's how the radiologist on that waveform is really gonna see that the valve is functioning properly. So here we have normal waveform, normal waveform, and then whoop, we squeezed and then our vein closed and is now starting to work back normal again. So we don't wanna see our squeeze all the way over here, right? Or we don't wanna see half of the squeeze here. We wanna see it somewhere in the middle of that spectral waveform or window. So here we have our transverse pictures. I mean, transverse pictures, it's kind of, it is what it is. Um, I can't really show you guys uh, unless we're actually scanning. But starting all the way up in the groin, a lot of times this picture is going to be the easiest one for you to find. But if you start there, you need to be aware that you need to sweep a little bit higher up into the pelvis so that we're just seeing the common femoral artery and the common femoral vein. So if you see your greater saphenous vein, go a little bit higher. Then we're gonna come down, we're gonna see that Mickey Mouse sign with our greater saphenous vein coming off of the um, common femoral vein. And then as we continue to come down, sometimes we'll see the profunda vein coming off as well, but on most patients, we're not gonna see the profunda vein. Um, so we're gonna see our femoral artery, femoral vein, and then we get to the knee. And now we're gonna see the vein on top popliteal vein on top and then popliteal artery underneath it. And then when we evaluate our vessels in sagittal, I'm trying to show you guys here the directional relationship that each segment of the leg should look like. So our common femoral, we need to see it going up our screen. So that's proving that we are heel-toeing up into the pelvis. 
And then when we get to common femoral over here with our greater saphenous coming off, we're still keeping that slight angulation upward. Then we start to come down, right? And we see that split of our femoral vein and our profunda. This should be blue, but that doesn't really matter for this. So we're seeing that coming down and we're seeing that split of the common femoral vein into just the femoral vein and the profunda vein. Then we're following that femoral vein down the leg. And then we're back at the popliteal fossa. Now the popliteal fossa, because of the way that we're scanning it and we're approaching it from the posterior aspect of the patient, it's going to now look like it's still going up our screen. So this is kind of like how we scan the aorta, right? Prox aorta, you have it going up the screen, mid-aorta, we're kind of coming around the top, and distal aorta, we're kind of coming around the bottom. The reason why we need an angulation on our picture we're going to learn about in physics are the Doppler properties. So you need to have some type of angulation to get our vessel to fill and to get an accurate waveform when we actually Doppler it. So just finishing up here with how we're scanning the calf. So calf veins can be very tricky to see. Um, it can also be even harder to see if there's a Baker cyst behind the patient's knee. Baker cysts are usually going to be moon shaped or crescent shaped, and they can actually extend all the way down the patient's entire calf. So we need to be aware of us um, evaluating those properly. It can also make it harder for us to compress the popliteal vein and some of the calf veins because you have this huge collection of fluid there. So you're compressing through the fluid. So we want to make sure that that pop vein is still patent, even if there is a really big Baker cyst in that region. Now, the gastric memeus veins, these we're going to see branching directly off of the popliteal vein behind the knee. They're going to kind of branch off in the same region, and the medial one is going to branch off first, and then the lateral one is going to branch off second. The lateral gastroc is going to kind of dive down very medially into the patient's leg, um, and then the medial gastroc is going to kind of go, going to go down the posterior aspect of the leg. As we know, our PTVs and our peros join together and they join with the anterior tibial veins to become the popliteal vein. So we're gonna see those PTVs and those peros really closely related to that pop vein. So as we come down from our popliteal vein, we're gonna see all of these branches starting to come off and those are gonna represent the PTVs and the peros. Our PTVs are going to be slightly more superficial. So towards the top of our screen and then the peros are gonna be deeper and more posterior in the leg. So here we have a nice transverse picture of our um, gastroc veins. So we usually evaluate these in sagittal. I find them easiest in sagittal. Um, I will show you guys how to approach these. And then we also have our PTVs and paros. So this picture is really what we want to start with. And then we want to do our compression as well. And then here we have our beautiful Sag picture. I mean, this is the picture that everyone shoots to get, but sometimes we can't always get all four of them nice and parallel together. So we at least at a bare minimum need to be doing compression of them. Um, and sometimes you can't get them both in the same picture. So if you need to focus on just the PTVs first and then do a picture of the perineals, that's totally fine. Um, but it's easiest to get all four of them together um, in terms of documentation purposes. And then lastly, what is a DVT going to look like? I mean, they're so highly variable. Um, sometimes they're going to be as obvious as this right here, very echogenic. Um, they're going to be non-compressible. So that's going to be the main thing that gives it away. So if you're looking at this top picture here, you're probably thinking, mm, that vein wall looks like really prominent, really thick, right? And then you go to compress it and it doesn't compress. So that's going to be a little bit more of a discrete finding of um, a DVT. Now, when you have a non-compressible vein, you want to annotate that. So you would label this, um, you know, transverse, right, femoral vein, proximal, um, and then you would write, you know, with compression. And then you could write NC non-compressible. Sometimes you'll see VNC, vein not compressible. And then you want to do a measurement 
just an AP measurement to show that that vein truly has not compressed. Every place has a little bit of a different protocol, but we need to make, make that aware with our annotation on our picture. And then the more obvious clot on the bottom, that transverse picture pretty much gives it away. And then when you turn sagittal on it, you can see this whole clot really extending for distance in that vein. And we're only getting a little bit of blood flow traveling through. 